Hey folks, tons of people come to this YouTube channel for bluegrass guitar content and now a little bit of bluegrass mandolin content, but I noticed that so many of you are new to the genre and are finding me through artists like Billy Strings and Molly Tuttle, which is awesome. I love what they're doing. I love those folks, but I thought that it might be helpful to give you a little background on flat picking. So today I'm going to go through a few notable pre-bluegrass acoustic lead guitar players. They might not all be flat pickers, but all of them did have a huge influence on what would become bluegrass flat picking. Remember that bluegrass is a genre that's constantly being pulled in two directions. So on one hand, there's this really a appealing aspect of like tradition and authenticity, and this feels real. On the other hand, bluegrass is inherently a very progressive, evolving art form. That's how it was created. It, it was an evolution and it continues to evolve. So over the course of bluegrass, tons of people have bent rules or broken rules and pushed the genre further while still maintaining some semblance of this adherence to tradition. So today we're talking about some of that tradition that's constantly being referenced. Ho hopefully this will give you a better understanding of where bluegrass came from and why the rules that are bent or broken get bent or broken. So the first guitar player that I wanna talk about is Mother Maybelle Carter of the Carter family. She was born in 1909 in Virginia, and she actually played a lot of different instruments, but according to some sources, seriously started practicing the guitar at around the time that she was 13. Now the, the Carter family had lots of musicians in it, notably had A.P. Carter, who was kind of a song collector, a little bit of a businessman, and he would run around and he would collect these songs with a guy named Leslie. I gotta look it up. We're going off the top of the dome, okay? What was Leslie's last name? Leslie Riddle. So AP Carter would roll around with Leslie Riddle and they would learn these folk songs, or rather Leslie would learn them. I hear that train coming down the track. Gonna carry me away, but ain't gonna bring me back. A.P. Carter and Leslie Riddle would then travel back home and teach these songs to Maybelle Carter and Sarah Carter so they could be performed as part of the Carter family set. You can wash my jumper, starch my overhaul, catch a train they call the cannonball from Buffalo, Washington. They would also lie a little bit and say that they wrote them, or at least some of them, which makes uh, some of the musicology efforts a little bit difficult because we don't know what the original sources are for some tunes, thanks A.P. Carter. But they were first recorded in 1927 in Bristol, Tennessee, by a guy named Ralph Peer, who I believe was working for the Victor Recording Company. He got sent down there with a, with a tin can, <laughs> you know, and who's gonna sing in the tin can for money? And he found the Carter family, and he found uh, Jimmy Rogers too. There, there's a little bit of like a folk tale that gets told about Mother Maybell's guitar playing, and it almost certainly, 100% is not true, but I'm gonna tell it anyway because it's, it's a nice story. So the story goes that they went in to record for Ralph Peer and um, in a hotel in Bristol. They get down to record and all the songs are too short. And Ralph Peer says, we gotta figure out a way to get these songs longer. So Maybell goes home to her uh, hotel room and uh, she figures out this way that she can play uh, these lead guitar parts. They come back and they record again and suddenly all the songs are the right length and the Carter family is famous, right? <laughs> Once again, I don't think that story is true, but isn't it a fun story? So the way that Mabel would do this, there's a couple different ways that she would do this, but she had a thumb pick and I believe that sometimes she would wear a finger pick too, but she would strum with her index finger and she would play the melody notes on the bass strings with her thumb pick. So the motion kind of looks like this. There's lots of recordings of her playing simple melodies like that as you know guitar breaks as guitar solos it's a really interesting thing she also did it the other way where she would play a melody on the higher strings and then strum the lower strings with her thumb pick you can find tons of recordings of that i highly recommend that you look it up let's listen to one right now
by the way, I said I would do this and I almost forgot. Uh, I would consider the Carter family to be early country music, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up, let's stay in 1927, would be Riley Puckett. Riley Puckett was uh, a founder of this highly influential old time band called the Skillet Lickers. Um, you can find out more uh, information about them. Certainly, I'm just gonna talk about Riley right now. He is the originator of what we call the Lester Flat G run or some variation of it. Riley Puckett used to play these bass lines that everyone copied after him. His rhythm work in general is just super cool and very progressive for the time period. So you should study it. You should watch some of these videos because they're super cool. But he does actually play some straight up lead work. You can hear him play lead guitar. Riley Puckett is, I think, one of the biggest slights in, in bluegrass history. Uh, it should be the Riley Puckett G-Run that we're all playing, but instead it's the Lester Flat G-Run. Maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Anyway, listen to Fuzzy Rag. to 1930, we should talk about Roy Harvey. Roy Harvey was the guitarist for another very important kind of pre-bluegrass band. I would call them an old time band really, which was Charlie Poole and the North Carolina Ramblers. Charlie Poole has a really interesting history. There's a, a Steve Martin documentary about the history of the banjo and he talks a lot about Charlie Poole. Definitely go watch that if you wanna learn more. Anyway, Roy Harvey also cut uh, solo recordings though. He was a little bit of a businessman and I read somewhere that some estimates are like 200 albums he cut over the course of like three years. I mean, just insane. Uh, his most significant recordings though are from between 1929 and 1930. In his playing, you can certainly hear some of that like boogie woogie creeping in, which is very cool. We hear that in a lot of early bluegrass guitar players like Bill Napier and George Shuffler, but we're not there yet. Um, why don't you take a listen to Roy Harvey playing Jefferson Street Rag. This is from 1930. Moving right along to 1933, this is the Delmore Brothers. The Delmore Brothers are what people tend to call brother duets, two people singing very tight harmony together. And the Delmore Brothers were, were super influential uh, in that space. You, another famous brother duet act would be the Monroe Brothers, which is Charlie Monroe and Bill Monroe. Bill Monroe would go on to create bluegrass. These brother duets would kind of travel from radio station to radio station. They'd play gigs like that. It's a very like early radio uh, kind of practice to do brother duets. But what's really cool about the Delmore Brothers is they had lead guitar. Um, and I believe uh, Alton Delmore would play uh, the tenor guitar. They recorded for Columbia Records in 1931, and then they signed a contract with uh, Victor, which is what the Carter family were signed to. Uh, and it was the it was like the Victor subsidiary uh, Bluebird, which was kind of like the budget label, I guess. They did that in 1933. And they started performing on the Grand Ole Opry and they got very popular. They were one of the more popular acts on the Opry in this time period. So a bunch of these Bluebird era recordings feature Alton's lead guitar. Later on, they recorded with a harmonica player whose name I can't remember. I'm sorry, harmonica player. But uh, the harmonica player ends up taking over a lot of the lead work. But if you listen to this era, you get to hear a bunch of lead guitar in a brother duet format. Of, of all the songs they wrote, because they wrote thousands, one of the ones you might know is Brown's Fairy Blues, which was a popular hit for Doc Watson, and later on, a popular song for Billy Strings as well. So if you listen to Alton's uh, guitar work, you can see that it's kind of the prototype for Doc Watson's break. And then if you listen to Doc Watson's break, you can see that it's the prototype for Billy Strings' break of the same song. Hard love, propaganda, and new ground. 
So before I ramble too long, let's get to 1945. 1945 is the beginning of bluegrass. The brother duet, the Monroe Brothers, has broken up. Bill Monroe has gone to strike it off on his own. He started Bill Monroe and his Bluegrass Boys. And that band is doing well, but 1945 is the year that they do real well. <laughs> we kind of call it like the, the birth date of bluegrass. And it's the kind of just the first lineup that really shouts bluegrass. And this lineup included Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs. Lester Flatt on guitar, Earl Scruggs on banjo. They would later leave Bill Monroe to form Flatt and Scruggs, which they toured and recorded under that name. Might even be more familiar to you, depending on what your history with bluegrass is. But Lester Flatt's big contribution <laughs> and maybe most obvious contribution to the world of bluegrass guitar is the ubiquitousness of the Lester Flat G run, which we now know is very derivative of the work that Riley Puckett did 20 years earlier. I think the difference is, is that uh, Lester Flat really only played this lick kind of one or two ways. And <laughs> so because Lester Flat hammered it into all of our brains, we all very specifically play Lester Flatt's version as opposed to much of the work that Riley did, even though it was so cool. Since this was kind of the only lick that Lester could play, maybe that's mean, that's not quite true, but you know what I'm getting at. You can hear certain songs where Lester Flatt will take a guitar break and he'll just play the same lick over and over again. So for instance, here's Foggy Mountain Special. <laughs> Remember I said that this, you know, boogie woogie feel would be a big influence in early bluegrass guitar? That that was kind of happening in all of country music. So if we move forward to 1948, there's a guy named Arthur Smith. And Arthur Smith's guitar boogie is this big leap forward in flat picking. To me, this is the first recording that we're listening to that sounds a lot more like modern players. Even though it's not bluegrass per se, it sounds like something that a flat picker might actually play still in the modern era. It's a much heavier kind of improvisation element. There's this undeniable blues and jazz influence. That doesn't surprise me because Arthur Smith and his brother started out as a Dixieland combo. I think uh, Arthur Smith was playing trumpet or something and they just found way more success as a country band and so he is really known as a guitar player. Sometimes actually called Arthur Guitar Boogie Smith. <laughs> the song title is embedded in his name. Yeah, he ended up kind of embracing this country blues sound. Despite there being some great country recordings like Arthur Smith's that, that feature flat picking, there was relatively little flat picking to be found in the bluegrass world still. Lead guitar would kind of not be a staple of the genre for some time. Uh, instead, the lead role in bluegrass was filled by other instruments that you'd expect, right? Mandolin, banjo, fiddle. Uh, the next logical step, if you wanted to continue this dive into history, would be to look at players like George Shuffler and Bill Napier and Don Reno too. And you can see me talk about some of those players in my bluegrass cross picking video, because George Shuffler's approach to playing lead bluegrass guitar was very specific and it's called cross picking. And I did a whole video on that rather than trying to give, you know, a one minute synopsis. You should probably go watch that video and it'll take you a little bit further in time, maybe up to the 60s, which would be a time period when you should start looking at people like Tony Rice, Doc Watson. I hope you like this video. I'm hoping to do more like it so I can get through more generations. This is kind of just free bluegrass and the very beginning of bluegrass that I covered here. Um, also, I recited most of this information off the cuff. I took some uh, sort of bare notes just from memory so I wouldn't forget some things I wanted to say. But if, if there's any corrections you want to add, please do. Also, feel free to list a bunch of other early guitar players. There's just not enough time in a short YouTube video to list all of them. I'm really just trying to get newcomers interested in the history of the genre. Um, so that way they'll dig more on their own. So definitely check out the rest of my channel for more bluegrass stuff. Check out my website for more bluegrass content as well. Snag some merch, sign up for lessons, all that good stuff you can do over there. Anyway, I'll see you all next time. Through the valley below, my was running from town. Now the
at midnight train.